The Orioles were struggling, the offense was sputtering, and the team needed a spark. So they thought, why not call up Colton Kowser, our number two prospect? So that's just what they did. And he came up to the big leagues, got his first hit, and helped the Orioles beat the Yankees on Wednesday. I'll recap it all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, July 6th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap a huge Orioles win on Wednesday night as they beat the Yankees 6-3 to to get out of their funk, specifically offensively, and they got some help from Colton Kowser, who was called up to make his Major League debut on Wednesday. I'll get to the five things you need to know from the Orioles' win, including Cedric Mullins breaking a slump and Dean Kramer putting together his best start of the season, and then we'll talk Colton Kowser, what kind of player he is, what the other roster moves were, and how he fits in this Orioles lineup moving forward. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube page as well. Thank you so much specifically to the everydayers out there, the people who are with us every single day. And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Sleeper. Swing for the fences on sleeper picks, and you could win up to 100 times your money. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code Locked On. You'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. So we start today with an Orioles victory. Final score from Yankee Stadium in the Bronx on Wednesday night is the Orioles 6 and the Yankees 3 as the O's take Game 3 of the four-game series and once again continue the streak of the season, not being swept all year and haven't been swept since calling up Adley Rutschman, and give themselves a chance to split this four-game series if they can get a win on Thursday. But the Orioles win it 6-3, to three, and finally, after losing 6 out of 7, they get to win number 50 on the season at 50-35 and 35 and create three games of separation between them and the Yankees for the first spot in the American League wildcard standings. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 6-3 to three win over the Yankees. And the first thing you need to know is Colton Kowser is here. Colton Kowser impressed in his first game. Kowser getting the call up on Wednesday after being reported Tuesday night by Rock Kabako of MassInSports.com. We'll get to who Kowser is and how he can contribute more a little bit later, but a really nice first game for Kowser. His first at-bat, he sizzles a ball up the middle, almost takes off the head of Yankee starter Randy Vasquez and a nice catch made at shortstop by Anthony Volpe, but just a casual line drive up the middle off the bat of Kowser in that second inning at 108 miles per hour off the bat. Then he grounds out in his second at bat, but his third time up, Kowser comes through in a big way. An RBI single in a left on left situation against the lefty Nick Ramirez got the Orioles on the board, made it a two to one game in the sixth, and really sparked that four run sixth inning for the Orioles. Kowser, you know, it wasn't exactly the hardest hit ball, but placed it well into the outfield. He would walk later in the game, made all the plays that came to him in left field. Overall, a very positive MLB debut for Colton Kowser. Second thing you need to know from this one is Kowser's buddy Jordan Westberg kept things going in that big sixth inning and gave the Orioles the lead in this one. Jordan Westberg coming up with his biggest hit since being called up and joining the Orioles, a two-run triple in the sixth inning off of Yankees stud reliever Michael King, gave the O's a 3-2 to two advantage in the sixth. Westberg getting a pitch to hit on the first pitch he saw from King, 97 miles per hour off the bat, a triple into left field to score two runs and put the O's on top. It was awesome. I mean, absolutely awesome to see 
Kowser and then Westberg go back to back there with the big hits to drive in runs. That was the future of the Orioles right there. It was the four run sixth inning. They got two more in the ninth off of the Ryan O'Hearn line drive home run. And that was all they needed. Six runs. Been a while since the Orioles put up a number like that, but that was certainly nice to see. And the third thing you need to know from this one, another reason why the Orioles offense got going is that Cedric Mullins finally got going for the first time since returning off the injured list. Mullins had been great before he went on the IL with that groin issue. Then he was five for 35 since coming off the IL with the groin injury, started the game 0 for 2, had two different spots early in the game when he came up with two runners on and two outs and was retired both times. But he flipped the script in the sixth. He started the rally with a double. Then he would double later in the game as well. Ended up with a two-hit night with a couple of doubles for Cedric Mullins, two for five. That was huge for him. Hadn't had an extra base hit since he came off the IL. Got two of them in Wednesday's game. Huge sign for the Orioles. Fourth thing you need to know from this one as we switch over to the pitching side, Dean Kramer put together his best start of the season. And if we're being honest, this coming off arguably Dean Kramer's worst start of the season. That's what made it so much more impressive what Kramer did on Wednesday night. After just getting hit around hard in his last start, Kramer goes out there at Yankee Stadium. O's have lost six of seven. All the pressure's on. And all he does is go seven innings, allowing two runs, only one earned on four hits, with a career-high 10 strikeouts to only one walk. The one earned run he did allow was a solo home run hit by Josh Donaldson to lead off the fifth inning that gave the Yankees a one nothing lead. Then eventually Kyle Higashioka had an RBI single in that fifth inning that came right after that scary moment when Gunnar Henderson's errant throw ended up hitting one of the camera people in the camera well who had to be stretchered off the field. Luckily, the camera person was seemingly alert, gave a little thumbs up as he was stretchered off, but hopefully, hopefully, sending our thoughts to him, he is okay. But Dean Kramer was able to settle in after that, got through the sixth, and the big thing was getting through the seventh, ending the seventh with a huge strikeout on a 3-2 pitch of Isaiah kiner falefa Through 103 pitches, only five hard-hit balls. Remember, even when Kramer's been good this year, Generally, he's given up a lot of hard contact. That was not the case on Wednesday, which beyond the 10 strikeouts, that was probably the best sign, the lack of hard contact. And then it was just whiff city for Kramer on Wednesday night. 18 whiffs on 45 swings. That's a 40% whiff rate. That was elite from Dean Kramer. His fastballs were almost unhittable. 12 swings on the four-seamer got six whiffs. 12 swings on the cutter, got eight whiffs. He basically threw almost exclusively four seamers, sinkers, and cutters, and it worked, just dominating this Yankee offense. And sometimes when you are in a rut, all you need is a pitcher to go out there and just lay it all on the line. Just completely hold down an opposing offense to give your offense just enough time to score enough runs, and that's what Kramer did. He became the stopper for the O's, a huge outing, and a huge win. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 6-3 victory over the Yankees is that Yenye Cano allowed his first home run of the season. It was a great stretch for Cano, who's going to the All-Star game next week. But he came in in the eighth inning with the Orioles leading 4-2, and Anthony Volpe led off with a Yankee Stadium homer to right field to make it a 4-3 game. Cano did allow another base runner on an infield single. His first homer came to the 153rd batter he has faced this season. That's pretty impressive. It's still been an amazing year from Cano. Didn't have his absolute best stuff, but he got two big outs, and then the Orioles handed it over to Felix Bautista, and he did what he does. A four-out save for Bautista, his 23rd save of the year, ending it with a strikeout at 102, and the Orioles win the game 6-3 to three over the Yankees to get game three out of four in this series. But, of course, the win is huge for the O's. And you can't help but think it was sparked at least a bit by Colton Kowser's promotion. And that's what we're going to talk about coming up next. Colton Kowser is here. So if you haven't heard much about him, we'll talk about kind of the scouting report on Kowser, how good he's been in AAA, and what the other moves were that the Orioles made as they did a bit of a roster shuffle before Wednesday's game. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Sleeper. Sleeper, well, this 
it's kind of daily fantasy sports, but in an even better way. At least for me, when I play Sweeper, this is the most enjoyable way to play it. You just you look at a lineup and you say, you know what? Here's who I want to see hit a homer, and here's who I think will hit a homer. Because if you want to win 100 times your money on Daily Fantasy Baseball, Sleeper is now offering up to a 100 times payout for up to eight pick contests. Choose as many as eight players that you like and pick more or less on your favorite baseball stats like homers, strikeouts, hits, and more. So you put together a lineup of all the Orioles, say they're going to hit more than two home runs. That's what you're cheering for. And you go on the app, it's super easy to use. You can pick your favorite players. It's just very, very fun to play. And you can win money, and the withdrawals of that money are safe, and they're fast. And you can make your entries in less than 30 seconds. It's super easy. So use the promo code Locked On, and you'll also get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms for use details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. Well, the Orioles took down the Yankees 6-3 to three on Wednesday night, kind of starting to crawl their way out of that skid where they lost 6 out of 7. Hopefully, this is the first step to doing that with a win at Yankee Stadium. And one of the biggest reasons, you got to feel like the O's won this game on Wednesday night, is because of the arrival of Colton Kowser. Reported late Wednesday night by Rock Cabaco of Masson that Colton Kowser was headed to New York to join the Orioles. And of course, he was activated to the roster on Wednesday afternoon. Now, you've probably heard a lot about Colton Kowser if you've been following the Orioles. And if you listen to this podcast, you've heard me talk about Colton Kowser a lot. But if you're not super familiar with Kowser, he's a new Oriole. He's going to be playing a lot. You know, started in left field, batted seventh on Wednesday night, got on base a couple of times, got his first hit in RBI. He's going to be a big part of this Orioles team, not just for the rest of this year, but probably for years to come. So it's good to kind of know where where did Colton Kowser come from? Who is he as a baseball player? Well, he is a 23-year-old left-handed hitting outfielder, a Texas native who went to college at Sam Houston State. Now, not a huge school, but it's a Division I pretty solid baseball program. And Kowser was selected after an amazing junior year at Sam Houston State in 2021. The Orioles took him with the fifth overall pick in the 2021 MLB draft. Now, some people thought that was a little bit of a stretch, that Kowser was more like the 10th best player in the draft or so. But others, like Joe Doyle, who I had on the podcast then and will have on the podcast tomorrow to talk about the draft coming up on Sunday, said that Kowser was the second best college hitter in that draft and talked about how Kowser didn't even know how high his own ceiling was. We're seeing how high his ceiling can be now. Kowser, who was kind of a guy who, who brought the power on late in his college career, was always an amazing hitter. O's take him fifth overall. And he climbs through the minors quickly. Has a great finish to 2021 in Delmarva and Aberdeen. Then gets himself to Bowie in 2022. Lights the world on fire and gets to AAA Norfolk at the end of the 2022 season. Wasn't amazing, but put up some solid stats. Starts the year in AAA in 2023. And he has just been incredible. Some amazing stats got him to the number two prospect in the Orioles system and was a top 15 prospect in all of baseball at some outlets before the call up. But Kowser at AAA this season in 56 games with the Norfolk Tides and 257 plate appearances was hitting 330 with a 459 on base percentage and a 537 slugging. That is a 996 OPS for Colton Kowser. A 153 WRC plus means he was 53% better than the league average AAA hitter. He had 10 homers, 10 doubles. He was seven for eight stealing bases, can show off a little bit of speed. And his 19% walk rate was a professional best for him. It's pretty impressive to have your highest walk rate in the minors be at the AAA level. And his 23% strikeout rate was way down from what it was in 2022. Two amazing signs for Colton Kowser. And it's not just that. It's not like he was just beating up on righties as a left-handed hitter and then struggling against lefties. He had great numbers against both. Now, granted, he was better against righties. Against right-handed pitching in AAA, hit 336 with a 1025 OPS. But even against lefties, Kowser was wearing them out too, hitting 313 with a 903 OPS against left-handers. He played center field 
at Sam Houston State in college, and he's played a good amount of center field in the minors. Now, long-term, most people project him to be a really good corner outfielder, but not quite a you know big league good defensive center fielder, but he can play all three outfield positions. I think he's going to be able to man left field even at Camden Yards, the bigger left field. I don't see him playing a lot of center, and we'll get to that, but he's going to be a good right fielder or good left fielder, and he can play center field defensively if you need him to as well. Again, this is the Orioles' number two prospect. This is a guy who they're going to expect a lot out of moving forward. Great hitter in the minors, really polished hitter, has it all together. Kind of similar as a prospect to Jordan Westberg, where there's not one tool that is like just incredible and blows you away, but he's just a really, really good baseball player all around. The two of them are friends, Westberg and Kowser, two of them coming up around the same time, and hopefully here sparking the Orioles. Now, Obviously, with Kowser coming up, there were some roster moves that had to be made. And they could have easily just made kind of a one-for-one -one deal, but the Orioles did do a little bit more shuffling. So first thing you need to know is they made two DFAs to clear two spots on the 40-man roster. Chris Valamont and Anthony Bemboom were both DFA. Now, Valamont had been optioned to AAA the day before, so he was just DFA'd to clear a spot on the 40-man so that they could get not just Kowser, but another player onto the 40-man roster. Anthony Benboom was out of options. The O's carried him as a third catcher during Tuesday's game. As I said, they weren't going to carry a third catcher for much longer, so they DFA'd Benboom as well as James McCann is back and healthy as Adley's backup catcher. So they made the two DFAs, but Benboom was the only one who was on the active roster, and the Orioles made another addition to the active roster as they called up the right-handed reliever Edward Bizzardo to hopefully help out this middle relief and this bullpen a little bit more. Now, Bizzardo was a guy who the Orioles picked up with a minor league signing this offseason, but Bizzardo actually had a good amount of success in the big leagues last year. He pitched in the majors with the Red Sox last season, and in 16 and a third innings, it's a small sample size, but he had a 2.76 ERA. I don't really know why the Red Sox got rid of him, but they did for some reason, and the Orioles picked him up as a minor league free agent, and he's been pretty good in AAA Norfolk. Bizzardo with the Tides this year, 24 appearances out of the pen in 33 and a third innings, has a 3.51 ERA, a 28% strikeout rate well above league average, a 7% walk rate is below league average. He's got some good stuff. It's kind of a fastball sinker combination, both pitches about 94 to 96. The slider is the wipeout pitch. That is the strikeout pitch. It's the whiff pitch. It's really good. Throws it about 82 to 85. A lot of the times, Bizarro will throw more sliders than fastballs. That's how much he trusts that pitch. And then he does have a splitter. It's not a Felix Bautista level splitter, but it's at about 89 to 90, and it can get some swings and misses. He'll throw that pitch a lot against lefties. Now, Bizarro not going to be asked to do a lot out of the pen, but another one of these guys who the O's picked up, who's got some good metrics, who they hope can help them in the bullpen. So you had Kowser come up, basically taking Ben Boom's place on the active roster and Ben Boom's place on the 40-man. You had Bizzardo come up, taking Valamont's place on the 40-man, but there needed to be another spot opened up on the 26-man active roster. And because the O's probably want to carry six outfielders, it was Ryan McKenna who was optioned to triple in Norfolk. Now, this is something that I had talked about for a while. Just McKenna not really starting much at all. You felt like at some point it was going to have to give, and McKenna was going to go down to AAA. This is his final option year, and it did finally happen on Wednesday. McKenna, who has played a good amount because he's spent so many games as a defensive replacement and a pinch runner, has played in 63 games for the Orioles this year, but only 89 plate appearances in 63 games tells you he's not really hitting too, too much. Now, at the plate, he hasn't been terrible. Hit 253, 315 on base, 392 slugging. 96 WRC plus means he's been just 4% worse than a league average hitter, basically league average this year. The defense has still been good. The issue has been for McKenna, and, and I know kind of his last time we saw him do something cool was the walk-off homer last weekend in the 10th inning against the Mariners. That was awesome. But the big drawback from McKenna this year, and I think this is the biggest reason why he was optioned, he's no longer mashing lefties. Even McKenna last year, who didn't play a lot, was great against left-handed pitching, and that's when he would start. McKenna this year is basically the same against lefties and righties, both right around uh, just below a league average hitter, 95 WRC plus against both. 
One of McKenna's biggest positive traits is a lefty masher. If he's not doing that, which he hasn't been doing this year, he loses a lot of his value. And what I will say about McKenna is, I do think with Westberg back, Hayes coming back, Kowser on the roster, I think they're going to move Jorge Mateo into more of a full-time bench role. That's the role Ryan McKenna had, kind of pinch runner defensive replacement. It's hard to go through a season with only 13 hitters on your roster where two of those hitters are full-time bench guys and are rarely in the starting lineup. It's just hard to maneuver your roster like that. So if you're going to move Mateo to that bench role, which I think they're going to do, you couldn't roster McKenna as well. You also don't really want six outfielders. So that's the move that is made. McKenna could be back. We'll see at some point. But right now, McKenna down, Kowser up, Bizarro up in the bullpen as well. But we talked about all that with the roster. The real question is, as we go back to Colton Kowser is, well, how's he going to fit in the lineup every day? Because we know the O's are going to try to play him a good amount. He's got a great bat. How are they going to get him in that lineup, especially when Austin Hayes, their all-star, is back and fully healthy? We'll try to parse out what the O's will do with the lineup coming up next. So in Colton Kowser's Major League debut, he gets himself a walk and an RBI single and helps the Orioles to a 6-3 to victory over the Yankees. So the O's know they won't be swept. Now they will try to split the four series here on Thursday in Bronx in the final game of a four-game set. It's another night game here on Thursday night, 7.05 p.m. Eastern time start. Kyle Bradish will go for the O's. He has been great lately, ERA down to 3.58. He'll take the baseball against Luis Severino, who the veteran righty for the Yankees just has not been good this year. Severino in eight starts has a 6.30 ERA on the season. His last start was a disaster. In St. Louis over the weekend, Severino allowed seven runs on nine hits over four innings. Orioles hoping to do something similar to him and split the series tonight. And you can catch every pitch of the Orioles' hometown radio broadcast of tonight's game between the O's and the Yankees with the SXM app through SiriusXM. Just download the app and search Orioles. And I would assume tonight against Luis Severino that Colton Kowser will be in the lineup for the second straight day in his second MLB game. And the question kind of becomes that we'll try to answer here to finish off the pod is, well, how does Kowser fit into this lineup moving forward? Because they got a lot of good outfielders right now on this Orioles team. First of all, I talked about this a little bit when Jordan Westberg was called up. If you noticed, Kowser got the hype video. Kowser's wearing a real number, number 17. That generally means that the Orioles plan to keep that player in the big leagues. Think about it. I talked about it before. Adley Rutschman, number 35. That is his number. Staying in the big leagues. Ryan Mountcastle came up, immediately got his number six. Staying in the big leagues. Jordan Wesper comes up, gets his number 11. Immediately hanging in there. Gunnar Henderson comes up, immediately gets his number two. Has been in the lineup almost every day since then. If you think about all these guys that the Orioles call up, when they give them a real number, that generally means they're going to stick around. On the flip side, Joey Ortiz got a spring training number, number 65. He's been up and down multiple times. Taron Vavra initially got number 77. Kyle Stowers initially got number 83. Both of those guys have been very up and down. So a good sign for Kowser that he got the number 17. So now you got five outfielders, right? You got Mullins, you got Hayes, you got Santander, you got Hicks, and you got Kowser. At this point, even though Hicks is slumping a little bit, and Mullins was slumping a bit until he broke out of it with the two doubles Wednesday. You want to get all five of those guys in the lineup as much as you can because they're all producing, or at least you think they all can produce, for the Orioles at this point. Now, against right-handed pitching, the O's should be able to get four of the five guys in the lineup. And I do think that maybe it's going to be tough to get all five of them in when Austin Hayes is back. Now, making it easy Wednesday night was that Austin Hayes still out with that hip issue, still day-to-day, but he did take batting practice each of the last two days. That tells me Hayes is very, very close to returning. He might even be in the Orioles lineup tonight. So when Hayes comes back, it's going to be tough because he's your all-star. He's in there every day. I know Mullins has been struggling, but he's your guy. He's in there every day. And honestly, Anthony Santander can move around defensively, but he's your power hitter and he's got to be in there every day. So against a righty, it's going to be really, really tough. And I do think Aaron Hicks against righties is going to be squeezed out of some of that playing time. 
You're going to see probably Hayes in left, Mullins in center, Kowser in right, Santander as your DH, and then Ryan O'Hearn playing first base. Now against lefties, that's where we could see Colton Kowser sit. I don't think he'll sit against every lefty. Brandon Hyde did let him hit against the lefty in the sixth inning Wednesday. That's when he came up with his first hit and the RBI single. But I think he'll sit him a bit against some tough lefties in the major. So when you got the lefty out there, you'll still have Hayes in center or Hayes in left, Mullins in center, and most likely Hicks in right. Then you could see some sort of combination of Santander playing some first base. I mean, Ryan O'Hearn most likely will sit versus left-handers as he's been doing. So you could still get Kowser maybe in there as the DH. That is, if you don't want to play you know, all of Mateo and Arias and Frazier and Henderson, we'll see what they want to do there. It's going to be interesting to parse it out. Against lefties for now, I think I would play Hayes in left, Mullins in center. I think I would play Kowser in right, Santander at first. And then in the infield, I would go Mateo at short because he can still hit lefties. I'd go Henderson at third, and I'd probably go Westberg at second with Arias and Frazier on the bench, and then you could DH Hicks with Kowser out there. Now, Kowser's going to sit sometime, so Arias can get in the lineup against lefties as well, but what's going to be really interesting is if and when Ryan Mountcastle returns, because he's going to play first base at the very least against lefties, and one of these outfielders is going to be out of the equation, and I think it's going to be Aaron Hicks who could be almost fully squeezed out if the bat doesn't get back to going once Ryan Mountcastle returns. But that is kind of a different question at this point. It'll be interesting to see what they do. I would play Kowser pretty much every day until Mountcastle's back. Then you have to figure it out again. And when Hayes is back, you're going to have to shuffle it a bit. I would take some playing time away from Aaron Hicks. The bat has started to kind of come back down to earth. Maybe you can sit Mullins a few times against some left-handers to keep getting Kowser in there. But I do think he's not going to play every single day, but most days of the week, similar to Westberg, Kowser is going to be in there, and you do have some options against some different kind of matchups to get your best lineup out there almost every night. The big thing with Kowser, the Orioles lineup is even deeper, even deeper than it was a day ago. This is kind of the best version of the O's right here. Lineup wise, I mean, you guys, you got guys like Ramon Arias who have been productive hitters sitting because you just can't get them in the lineup. That is a sign of a deep and productive order. Hopefully, it can spark the O's offense back in the right direction. And hopefully, they spark again here on Thursday night, get a win, and split the four game series. Now, I'll be back with you tomorrow. We will be recapping. Game four between the Orioles and the Yankees. Getting you a quick preview of Orioles at Twins before the All-Star break. But the big thing with tomorrow's episode is finally our conversation with Joe Doyle of Future Stars series. He covers all things MLB draft. He comes on this pod every year before the draft to preview what the O's will do. A little bit of a different Orioles scenario. They have the number 17 pick instead of the number one pick. So Joe joins us on tomorrow's episode. Talk about who could be available at number 17, what the O's could do with the draft and how the situation and the plan kind of changes when you pick lower in the first round. That's all coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.